ghosts are scary. They like to jump out at you and look all dead. They can guilt you about your past misdeeds, but they also don't make a whole lot of sense. Closet ghost? Yeah? Do you like video games? Uh, well, you know, I got into, uh, like, Mario and, and Zelda, Legend of Zelda, for a while. Uh, but nowadays I've been a little too busy, and I, you know, I can't spend all day playing them, and I have an addictive personality, so it's best that I just stay away from them, you know? No, no, I don't understand that. Um, can I have your soul? It was taken from me long ago. Ghosts are a staple of horror, but a subtle one that often plays off the psychological state of the characters. It's also relatively easy to work them into a game with graphical or budgetary restrictions. And boy, does Rhiannon, Curse of the Four Branches, have both a plenty. It's a point-and-click adventure game. Game? It's a point-and-click adventure game created by the Welsh Arberth Studios. Arberth Studios is essentially comprised of three people, all relatives with no prior experience in game design, so it's about as indie as it gets. This game is a ghost in and of itself, a ghost of a generation of graphics long dead. But is that a good thing? Are ghosts ever a good thing? Yes, they're very good. Now, bitch, if I wanted your opinion... Rhiannon is a game with some dense source material. It gets its name from an actual figure in Welsh mythology. Curse of the Four Branches is in reference to four stories from an ancient Welsh text called the Mabinogion. This medieval manuscript is where the game pulls most of its plot from. Rhiannon is also the name of what is arguably the main character, but not the character the player controls. In the awkward and rushed opening, it's explained that we are an ambiguous proxy named Chris. The Sullivan family has been having some issues, and decide to leave their lavish Welsh home for a while, and bring Chris in to feed the cat and watch over the place. Turns out there's ghosts, and you're just gonna have to deal with it if you want to keep feeding that cat. So, thankfully, we're controlling a character that has no qualms with digging up all this family's secrets, not limited to reading their teenage daughter's diary and email history. Through some good old-fashioned creeping, you find out that Rhiannon has been experiencing a lot of ghostly activity, as well as reoccurring nightmares. She thinks these experiences are linked to the historic significance of their new home and the land surrounding it, called Ty Pryderi. Dialogue is almost non-existent, so the majority of the info you get will be from straight reading books. After so much reading, you learn about these two wizards that were assholes to each other, and one puts a curse down the other, or something like that. It, it, it was interesting, but it was very convoluted. Long story short, this bad guy ghost has been killing girls named Rhiannon over the course of several decades, and you have to devise a spell to get rid of him and save Rhiannon from the present. In between, you'll learn a bit about the tragic fates of the last couple of Rhiannons. I like the idea of the story, but it does feel like we're fighting someone else's battle. We can immerse ourselves better with a blank slate character like Chris, and we do learn a lot about Rhiannon's mopey personality and love of DVDs! DVDs! Uh, but wouldn't the story mean more if we played as Rhiannon? Because what's Chris's motivation? He's the house sitter. What's he doing sleeping in this underage girl's bed? I mean, I know what he's doing, but come on, buddy, there's ghosts. We got other stuff to worry about. When we think about ghosts, we often think of them as malevolent, showing up out of anger or revenge, tormenting the guilty or infinitely repeating their tragic deaths. Conversely, there have been a lot of ghosts in literature and film with positive or helpful motives. Think Field of Dreams, Frequency, think Dennis Quaid, think Pandorum. Underrated, you should give it a shot. Rhiannon's ghosts are the friendlier variety, but the game maintains this pretense of horror. We're supposed to be afraid of these ghosts popping out with spooky music, but they want our help. What are they gonna do? I'm their only hope at stopping that wizard dick. I think the story has some intriguing roots and ideas, but I don't think it's produced a good story. We spend a great deal of the game learning about Rhiannon, but we don't see her complete a journey. Maybe I just like playing as teenage girls, but, you know, I I still think that, uh, that would have been a good... That would have been a good idea. Yeah. Playing Rhiannon is as simple as it gets. Despite the detailed tutorial at the beginning, at the end of the day, you just gotta click. You click left, you click right, you click. You click, it's that easy. Oh, shit, I clicked wrong. There's an inventory when you mouse over the top of the screen, and it's constantly filled with an absurd amount of junk that you have to slowly scroll through to get to what you want. A point of contention I have, though honestly a completely logical addition, you can't pick up items until you know you need them. In most adventure games, you find something and you're like, oh, a key, I'll probably need this. In this one, it's like, oh, a key. I don't know what it opens, so fuck it. The first half of this game has a very traditional spirit. 
It's that good old emphasis on invading people's privacy and trying to find keys to rooms that are locked purely to extend the length of the game. This part is enjoyable from a nostalgic standpoint. I mean, I've done this. It's understandable and sort of rewarding, but it's been done and done better. The second half revolves around completing different spells to collect orbs that will make up a bigger spell. These segments bug me because they border on being a hidden object game. You know the ones. There are billions of them, and some of them occasionally go on sale and have super cool names like Theater of the Absurd and Samantha Swift and the Hidden Roses of Athena. And you're like, ooh, what's this? But then you're like, oh, it's that. This whole process had me shaking my head. You get these lists of things that are required for each spell. Each spell requires a random assortment of items. But for being an ancient magic ritual, it's pretty lax on what qualifies as a suitable ingredient. Can't find a mouse? Get a computer mouse. I get it. Why would the spell take puns into account? It asks for a mouse, so why would it accept a piece of technology that hadn't even been dreamed of yet, just because it's called a mouse? It's stupid, I hate it. Why does it accept this flyer about a crib in place of a crib? Convoluted puzzles aside, it's not a difficult game to comprehend. It's just very video gamey. Chris seems to gleam a lot out of the vague circumstances of your actions, so luckily he's nice enough to keep a notepad with the next tasks written down. And uh, that's all I got for this. Uh, you, can, you can save the game. It's got a nice save feature. Put it right in there. I don't want to be harsh. This is someone's first try. I mean, it's not like the game's graphical shortcomings damage the gameplay. I still know where I'm going and what I'm doing, but I was really confused when I started seeing things like MP3 players and modern printers. It dawned on me. This game was not made in 1999. Again, nothing against the graphics, it's just like when you see a photo in some guy's house and you're like, hey, I didn't know you owned horses. And he's like, that's my wife. This game was released in 2008, and I, I can get past that. But there are also some incredibly tacky design choices, and they start right away. Look, look at this, we booted up. There's the studio splash screen. Already I'm upset. There's this poorly composed, overly lit, digital photo straight off a camera. It's so grody looking. Then the title appears, and it's got this black outline with green embossing. Then it gets a textured border. Studio logo comes back and gets this hideous subtitle, the premium edition. The blending effects are so bold, it's like jagging. Oh, I can't deal with it. Just take it away, please. And it doesn't stop. The photo fades into a Photoshop filter with the texture over it, and finally, we're at the main menu. After that mishmash of graphics, when the game starts, we're greeted with black text against white. It's like an email, but without an operating system or browser. And then it fades to a, a live action clip shot behind a car windshield, and then the text turns white. This is hurting me. It's like, it's like when anything uses papyrus font. Lamb of God, James Cameron, Joss Whedon. <laughs> the graphics are not a deal breaker for me, but it's slightly distracting how amateurish they can be. There is some voice work here and it's not very great. It's not terrible, but... Help me find them. Like the graphics, it's somehow very dated. I don't know how you can date somebody's voice, but... I can't help but think this might have been an attempt at replicating older adventure games, because if it was, it's a fantastic job, and I retract everything I've said. The music is surprisingly upbeat and jazzy considering the subject matter. It's just all in MIDI format, so it can occasionally sound grating, especially when the guitars come in. It's still fun though, I mean, for some reason I can picture it playing in a department store? Alright ladies. I'm waiting. This game isn't going in my top 10, or my top 50, but it's impressive knowing it was made with a handful of people with no prior experience. I respect that. They had a vision they cared about and wanted to see it through. I just, I don't want to see it anymore. It's really awkwardly put together, and there was too much of an emphasis on collecting random things for spells. It was also frustrating to be able to pick up items and look at them, but not take them, until Chris made a note of it. I mean, 
I'm gonna need it eventually, right? I, I might as well. It's a logical thing to add, but video games don't entirely need that kind of logic. When you die in Bioshock, you're recreated in a Vita chamber. This is the story's MacGuffin for allowing you to respawn after dying, and there is actual lore written that's canon explaining the logistics of this device, but it's not actually important. You respawn because you want to try again. You want to keep playing. Anyway, fans of the genre should give it a try. It's not a pricey game, and I would like to see the studio give game design another go, because it's rare that these games get made. Whether they meant to or it was an accident, it's an interesting, misshapen, strange, and premature creature. Thank you.